Good evening. Welcome to TCM. I'm Ben Mankiewicz. 29 years ago today, 6 p.m. Eastern, April 14th, 1994, host Robert Osborne signed Turner Classic Movies on the air. It has been a thrilling 29 years and two hours. Thanks for watching us, supporting us, and yes, correcting us too for nearly three decades. Just two years after that, in 1996, our parent company, Turner Broadcasting, merged with Time Warner. With that deal, we entered a corporate family that included the esteemed Warner Brothers studio. Happily, we're still together today, part of what is now Warner Brothers Discovery. Warner Brothers has a bigger birthday to celebrate this month. On April 4th, 1923, brothers Harry, Albert, Sam, and Jack Warner formed what soon became one of the most vital movie-making studios in Hollywood. All month, we're marking Warner's 100th anniversary with many of its best and most influential films. Among the movies we're presenting are 10 pictures that have been fully restored or remastered, part of our partnership with the Film Foundation, whose founder and chairman is director Martin Scorsese, a passionate and leading advocate for film restoration. Up next, we have one of those 10 pictures, an epic from director Howard Hawks in 1955, Land of the Pharaohs. Hawks shot Land of the Pharaohs in Cinemascope, and it's the grandest epic of his career. The film's size and scope are a big part of why Martin Scorsese remembers it so fondly. And here now, to introduce the film, is the man himself, Marty Scorsese. Hi, I'm Martin Scorsese. Thanks for joining me for this restoration of Land of the Pharaohs. And I saw Howard Hawks' Land of the Pharaohs for the first time when it came out in 1955 at the Mayfield Theater up on Times Square. I have to admit, I've never seen an ancient epic like Land of the Pharaohs. It casts a spell on you right from the opening credits, particularly with the music, the first notes that you hear of Dimitri Tiomkin's really extraordinary score, which is at times haunting and otherworldly, dynamic and propulsive, very strong. The music in this picture always adds layers of beauty and mystery, a kind of crystal sound that created a special total experience. This picture also started me on what became a lifelong obsession, which is a study of the ancient world. At that time, I was a kid, and I thought archaeology was one way to go, but was immediately absorbed into my fascination with filmmaking itself. And then as an aspiring filmmaker, I realized my only way into that world is through imagination grounded in history and archaeology. And I must say, I know no other film from that era made with such a deep sense of the past. Watching this film, every time I see it, it's like visiting another planet. In this case, the planet was Egypt during the Fourth Dynasty. Its architecture, its decorations, its clothing, its jewels, common ideas and beliefs about this world and the next world. The second life, as Khufu the Pharaoh calls it. Khufu's played by great actor Jack Hawkins. The contents of this room are the symbols of my life to come. And not to this life. Not to adorn my body or yours or any living thing. There were three writers on Land of the Pharaohs. Hawks worked with Harry Kernitz, Harold Jack Bloom, and William Faulkner. The problem was the script was still being put together during the long and very tough shoot which they decided, rightly so, to begin with all the most spectacular scenes and get the hardest stuff over with first. But the shoot was so tough. In fact, on one day, 60 to 66 people collapsed from the heat and two died. And ultimately, however the budget worked out and however the production problems overwhelmed the picture, they never really cracked the story, I think. Scenes between Hawkins and Joan Collins, the femme fatale, between Collins and Sidney Chaplin, they're not very good. At best, lurid melodrama. There's a sense of a 50s pulp paperback cover art feel to them. But they do clash with the originality of what's best and strongest in the picture. But in the story, what's interesting is that there are no concessions to Judeo-Christian values here, as in the DeMille epics. We really are on a different planet. The Pharaoh and his priest, for example, appear before their people surrounded by statues of the deities of Egypt. And the priest says, let the gods of Egypt speak. In the name of the gods, listen. And then people look over to one of the statues and the gods speak. You hear the voice of Osiris, of Isis, of Anubis. The gods of Egypt have spoken. The Pharaoh's goals and beliefs 
have absolutely really nothing to do with our own, I think. What's interesting about this character is that he's most interested in the gold. Maybe what you would say not a character that you could identify with these days in terms of empathy. It's bold because they just go for that. He wants the gold and jewels to prepare for a second life after death and the second lives of others as well. The pyramid is sort of a resurrection machine in which the pharaoh after his death embarks on a journey to the great primordial ocean to which he will help guide other souls. Now the production designer on Land of the Pharaohs is Alexander Trauner and he was a genius. Now Trauner and his team of course deserve so much credit for making the picture what it is, but this is also a Howard Hawks film quite unlike any of his others. In most of the ancient and biblical epics, everything, all the sets, everything is very large, very big, very ornate, very garish. But in Land of the Pharaohs, portions of each room in every building are just right. Even the pillars seem to be unique and fit the landscape and the story. The color palette is directly, I think, inspired by the colors of the tombs themselves, the specific reds and blues and buff color of the sand. The scale of the pyramids is as grand as it needs to be. And the locations are real excavation sites in Egypt, real quarries. The triumphal procession at the beginning of the film, that always is a key element in ancient epics. But the procession at the start of this picture, when the pharaoh returns from battle, is to me the definitive one. The length of the procession, the time it takes to show. Show the welcoming crowds, the chests of plunder treasure, the portions all seem exactly right, and the details aren't just opulent and flashy and fascinating. The number of extras in this thing is, you know, massive. Up to 10,000 extras at a time work for many days on the picture. And in the original CinemaScope frame, the old 255 aspect ratio, which was wider and thinner, you really see how the pyramids were constructed or could have been constructed detail by detail. I promise you that each man, by his labor, shall secure for himself a place in the life to come. What say you? Aye. The picture, Land of the Pharaohs, certainly wasn't a success when it came out. And it's never been treated with much respect. It has many flaws, but to my eyes, they're dwarfed by the greatness of the picture. This restoration, one of ten undertaken by this partnership between Warner Brothers and the Film Foundation, which is part of Warner Brothers' 100th celebration, will allow viewers to really experience Hawks' vision of the ancient Egyptian past, every stunning detail. For Turner Classic Movies and the Film Foundation, I'm Martin Scorsese, and I hope you enjoy the film. Director Howard Hawks said he made Land of the Pharaohs for one simple reason, Cinemascope. After making so many hits across multiple genres for Warner Brothers in the 1930s and early 40s, Hawks left the studio when he finished the 1946 noir The Big Sleep to become an independent filmmaker. When Warners gave him the chance to make a movie in Cinemascope, Hawks couldn't resist the opportunity to take on the one type of picture he'd never made before, a genuine Hollywood epic. In 1955, with television cutting deeply into Hollywood's bottom line, CinemaScope offered a new widescreen format that would present an exotic epic on a scale no TV network could create. Originally, Hawks wanted to direct a picture about the construction of a U.S. Air Force base in China during World War II, but that project fell through because of the political climate in communist China. Eventually, Hawks decided to shift his story to ancient Egypt. In director Martin Scorsese's introduction to Land of the Pharaohs, before the film, he praised Hawks' vision, but he credited production designer Alexander Trauner for making the movie what it is, noting that the original CinemaScope frame allowed audiences to see the intricate detail of the pyramids under construction. Here's something Martin Scorsese didn't mention, but wishes he had, the strong performance of Joan Collins as Princess Nellifer. So he asked us to give her a special shout out. And you don't have to twist my arm to praise Joan Collins. Coming up, another 1955 picture that shows off Warner Brothers' CinemaScope work. Henry Fonda, James Cagney, William Powell, and Jack Lemmon star in Mr. Roberts, next on TCA.